Okay, welcome. I'm David TM, PhD, as you guys all know in this room. And uh, I have a special class on the difference between love and attraction, and it's going to go into a lot more than that. But um, that's the overall theme. And the reason why I'm going over this is because there are a lot of guys in the Man Up Facebook group, which if you haven't joined, you should join. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been doing this for over 10 years. Uh, coaching tens of thousands of people around the world in over 87 countries about this. And I've discovered that one of the biggest misconceptions <clears throat> is, um, the diff is not understanding the difference between love and attraction. So that's what this presentation is going to be about. I notice in the video it might be pretty bright, this slide deck, uh, but I will provide <clears throat> the, uh, the, the downloadable link to the slides um, somewhere below this video. So uh, follow along as you watch this video. Have you ever experienced a case where uh, a girl that you like, or maybe your girlfriend at the time, um, said she loves you, she might even be in love with you, but she's hot for some other guy? <clears throat> or have you ever noticed that she's hot for other guys when she's in love with you? And a lot of, not just young guys, but guys in their 40s even, um, don't understand, in 50s and 60s actually, um, don't understand how that can be. How can it be that she could love me but not be hot for me? And there's a lot of misconceptions around what love actually is and what attraction is. And that's what's causing that difficulty. A lot of relationships will fail. In fact, almost all relationships in the 21st century will fail because of, of, a, of a fundamental misunderstanding about the difference between love and attraction. So if you don't understand this, you're going to get married, possibly, and it will fail. Or maybe you'll never get married because you won't last that long in the relationship. Um, and uh, unless you figure this out, you're not going to be able to sustain it and grow it, that relationship. And unless you understand this, you probably won't even be able to hook up very well if you don't understand attraction. And for a lot of guys who are looking for a woman to love them and a woman to love, who don't understand the difference between attraction and love, they're either gonna get cheated on or end up in a, a relationship of quiet desperation <clears throat> where, both, where, where both sides are um, missing the passion that maybe they once felt, but they all want no matter what. Um, I know this because these were the same things that I and all of well, all of mankind has experienced. The honeymoon stage of when you first meet a girl and it's all butterflies in the stomach and everything's wonderful. And then actually having to reach that point at the 18 month mark or a three year mark where it actually then becomes to a certain degree work. You have to put some intentionality into the relationship. You have to commit to it and take extra effort to grow the relationship. It doesn't just grow on its own. Um, for most people, because most people don't know the difference between attraction and love. And it made a lot of sense to me back then when I learned it. Oh, so that's why. That's why that relationship failed. Or that's why the passion fizzled away. Or that's why those feelings disappeared. It's because of this difference. Okay, so hopefully you've gotten your attention now on why it's so important. So in this presentation, I'll be going over the science of it. Always starting and ending with the science. Uh, and I'm going to go over quite a, well, I'm going to touch on some clinical psychology, the codependent neediness, parasitic neediness, and, um, and I will give you the antidote. Um, so I'm going to be sort of talking to this camera and sort of talking to you guys. <laughs> um, and I'm going to throw in there a very actionable, um, or something that's very relevant, practical, I should say, to most guys, which is how to know whether she likes you, or how to know whether she likes you. Uh, all right, so let's just dive in. What the science tells us about attraction. So we'll be drawing uh, here in this presentation on evolutionary psychology, as well as neuropsychology and um, sexology. It's a newer uh, research. And um, in fact, there's going to be another, I think we're going to put up another presentation on, um, on the internet uh, video where I go into more detail about the neuropsychology and the sexology. So a couple of the slides will be in common because they're more foundational slides. <clears throat> but in that presentation, I'm going to go into a lot more detail on um, just the sexual aspect of it, more of the sexual attraction. Uh, but here it's more of the attraction and love um, dichotomy. And the science also gives us lots of practical implications and applications. Um, so, uh, all right, so let's just get into it here. Passionate versus companionate. So uh, this, is, this diagram is taken from, uh, I can't really see very well in the video, Jonathan Haidt's book, uh, Happiness Hypothesis, and he got 
and this is, but it's a very common um, graph that you'll see in uh, evolutionary, evolutionary psychology uh, or just in psychology in general, especially around uh, couples counseling. And here there's two differences, or there are two different kinds of attraction here. He uses the word attraction to, to um, denote both of them, but um, I think different terms could be better. But basically it's companionate and passionate. So you see here the time is the x-axis and intensity is the y-axis. So the intensity of passion. So um, the, more, uh, the, the, the more time that, that elapses, the less passion is felt. So you see the passion goes down in intensity, the passionate love. But companionate love is something that grows over time and it takes quite a lot of time relative to passion to grow. So you see that they intersect somewhere around the three to five year mark roughly. And the companion of attraction grows over time and passionate just dips and then doesn't recover. Um, so this is the reason why a lot of love relationships fail because they're just focusing on the feeling of love. And of course the feelings of uh, romantic love that butterflies in the stomach can go along with uh, commitment at the, at the beginning because it's easy. Because you, you have the feelings of lust and, and connection, lust and connection, and it's easy to have that relationship at that, at that time. Over time, however, the lust goes away necessarily. It's just part of how we're hardwired, and there are all kinds of evolutionary psychology explanations for it, about adaptations and so on, um, but it, makes just, it just sort of makes sense that at the three to five year mark, um, that passionate lust will peter out, um, and it would have to be replaced by a more abiding commitment, which can then trigger and recreate. So this is an inaccurate graph in the sense of there is passion later in the relationship, but it's something that you have to do. You have to create it. It doesn't just happen naturally for 99% of people. If there are certain things that you need to do to be present in the relationship, to maintain the polarity, the sexual polarity, and the feminine masculine polarity in the relationship to cause it to, to grow. And in fact, there's a whole other uh, video course in um, the Man Up Primer, which you can get for free by joining the private Facebook group, the Man Up Private Facebook group. Um, and in that I go over uh, how to make a relationship passionate over the long term and all the research, what all the research tells us. So uh, actually in that video, you also would have seen this graph. So, um, so there's this companionate passionate shift. And part of the reason for that is global life expectancy. Um, and this is, it's, it shows us the red line for pretty much all of human history until um, the 1900s, and then it shoots way up, and now it's going exponentially higher. Um, but for most of human history, uh, for most of uh, homo sapien history, uh, life, life expectancy, which is different from span, but life expectancy, because uh, if you include infant mortality uh, or, or early childhood deaths, then it is around 20 to 25. Um, but um, if you make it past, I think it's like the fifth year of your life, your expectancy shoots up to 30 or 35 for most of homo sapien life. Um, but generally speaking, we're adapted evolutionarily to live less than 40 years. Um, so if there's some kind of, uh, if there's, if there's a homo sapien whose superpowers, whose you know, mutant powers don't kick in until he's 50, that guy won't be able to procreate very much because it, it, most people don't make it that far. So uh, most of our adaptations are for that 40 year span or less. So you see that in this graph. And that explains why we are hardwired to want the passionate love, which is like telling us go and mate and pro, you know, spread your genes and look for good genetic matches and just have lots of sex and, and, uh, and procreate. Um, versus what's actually good for you in a hundred year lifespan, right? How to, how to have a pair coupling, uh, a pairing um, for, that will last you that hundred years. It's not, something that, it's not something that we ever needed as homo sapiens because we didn't generally live that long or even close to it. But now we're sort of, we're, we're actually in that. Uh, many countries have like life expectancy over 80, 85, and uh, probably uh, for you guys in your 20s, uh, by the time you get to my age, your life expectancy might be over 100, <laughs> the rate we're going. So, so hopefully you see that there's this thing called passion and there's a way to think about it in terms of attraction. Passionate attraction. I haven't even gotten to lust per se yet. But why is it so easy to confuse love and attraction? Well, one is we never really had to make that distinction as we pointed out in the evolutionary history. 
between the lust and that connection because we generally didn't last that much longer. Um, but also, for psychological, psycho, psychological reasons, now I'm looking at it as a preview on my computer. Normally I would read it off of that, but then you'd be looking at the back of my head. So I'm going to try to read these small letters here. This is a great um, encapsulation of that view, and it's a, also taken from that, from that same book, The Happiness Hypothesis. And uh, it says, The troubadours <clears throat> did give us a particular myth of true love. The idea that real love burns brightly and passionately, and then it just keeps on burning until death. And then it just keeps on burning after death as the lovers are reunited in heaven. This myth seems to have grown and diffused in modern times into a set of interrelated ideas about love and marriage. As I see it, the author says, the modern myth of true love involves these beliefs. Okay. True love is passionate love that never fades. If you are in true love, you should marry that person. If love ends, you should leave that person because it was not true love in the first place. And if you can find the right person, you will have true love forever. <laughs> okay, those four beliefs. Uh, you might not believe this myth yourself, particularly if you are older than 30, but many young people in the Western nations are raised on it, and it acts as an ideal that they unconsciously carry with them, even if they scoff at it. And it's not just Hollywood that perpetrates the myth. Bollywood, um, the Indian film industry, and, and pretty much all, the whole world is even more, uh, is even more romanticized. But if true love is defined as eternal passion, it is biologically impossible. Okay. okay, so what are we after here? What are we trying to do? This girl who says, I'm in love with you, but I just, uh, that guy's hot, and I just cheated on him, cheated on you with him. Um, so how do we explain this? Well, let's get to the point. Attraction is an emotion, the way uh, that word ought to be used. You've, you're attracted to stuff that's an emotion, it's a feeling, okay? And feelings are fickle. Feelings are not entirely within your control. You might have heard uh, David D'Angelo, uh, it was like 15 years ago, and um, he, he, he wrote an ebook where he said, attraction is not a choice. It's a great way of putting the point that when we're feeling lust towards something, when your dick gets hard, or when her down there gets wet, that's not something that she rationalized her, like, that's not something that she, she arrived at through rational calculation. She didn't say, okay, his, his hip to waist ratio is exactly this much, and, his, and, and, okay, and he's wearing this, and his, his body fat percentage is this, therefore, okay, let, I'll allow it now, let, let get, let's get wet now. That's not how it happens. Right? It's just an immediate feeling, and it's, that's how lust works. This is how attraction works. Now, when you're confused that some girl falls out of lust with you, or falls out of attraction for you, that's really stupid because people's feelings change all the time. All right, so you guys know how fickle you are when you're on the porn sites and you keep switching channels like you're never satisfied. All right. <laughs> now we have those like free ones like Pornhub and shit like that where there's like a million channels at your disposal and that can only have happened if guys keep flipping around and that must be the case, right? Um, so you're that way too. Your erection is quite fickle as well. And uh, why would hers be any different? Now you're like, but it's different. It's love. All right, let's talk about love. So hopefully attraction as, as a feeling um, and then a, as an emotion, where an emotion is a little bit more complicated than a feeling, but basically neither of them are entirely, especially when, they, when we first feel them, within our control. What's in our control is what we do as a result, what our behavior or actions are, or what decisions we make as a result. But that initial feeling, very few people can actually do anything about those. Those are usually based on preconceptions or presu presuppositions that were already pre-existing. That's why pre, pre, pre. Okay, so that's, that's clear. Attraction is is a feeling, it's an emotion. What about love? Love is a feeling, love is an emotion, and this is the problem. This is where people, young people especially, confuse it just because they're both feelings. They talk about love as a pure feeling, and that's the problem. Let's get a little bit more sophisticated about love. Love is an English word. It's a funny English word because it's one of those very capacious English words that is very ambiguous. There are many meanings for love. You notice that when you use an important word and you look it up in the dictionary, like the Oxford English Dictionary, you will see many definitions. Some of them are very different, mutually contradictory sometimes. And when it comes to love, you can write entire books and volumes about the meaning of love. I just did quotes, air quotes on the meaning. So there are many ways of, of dividing this, analyzing it. What does it mean? I have on my arm up here the word I in Chinese. I don't know if you can see that. And that is supposed to mean love. 
but the um, the the what is the word the semantic range of I is quite different from the semantic range of the English word love. So let's get to one way of breaking down the English word love. Um, and in the Judeo-Christian tradition, in the Greco-Roman tradition, there were primarily, there were definitely dominantly three uh, words that were used to be later, that were later translated into English as love. Okay, so there's one, is eros, and this is usually like a lustful love. Or, and the, in that lustful love is also the rom romanticism, the romantic love. Okay, so there's that all like that, it's, it's like the Song of Solomon kind of love. Right, so there's, there's a lot of sex, but it's like loving sex. It's not like the kind of like hate sex that you guys do in gay. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right, so it's like that loving sex, like the sex between a, a, a loving couple. And then there's philia, and that's the love between brothers, brotherly love, or like really good friends, your best friend. And then there's a, agape, and that's a special term uh, in the Christian tradition, um, and that is a self-sacrificial love. The love that God had for, has for uh, human beings, and he gave his son to die, and that's agape, or agape. Um, Self-sacrificial love. And in and, and a, uh, a more less like grand way, that's the love of a mother, uh, a self-sacrificial love of a mother for her child. She would sacrifice her own life to save her child. That's the sort of agape um, that you will get there. And the storge is one that um, was less prominent, but that C.S. Lewis has written quite a bit about and reinserted back into the Christian tradition, so to speak, or not just him, but it's, it was always there. And storge is like affection. Okay, so that's different from all of those things. So affection might be like you have a little, like a, a really cute puppy that's been with you, or not, I guess a dog that's been with you for most of your life, and you have this affection for the dog. It, it's not like the dog needs to earn your love or anything. You give it, and it's, you know, you're affectionate with the, with the dog. And, of course, these are, there's no, like, a clear divisions or boundaries between each of these different kinds, and that's part of the reason why romantic love is so confusing for people. Romantic love includes all four types of all four types of love, or there are opportunities for what we consider to be the love between a couple, a man and a woman, um, in a you know like husband wife type of relationship, to experience all four kinds of love within their relationship. So obviously they're feeling the lust, they're feeling the eros, right? That's that's we don't need to talk about that, right? But then they're also feeling like they're friends, right? So you might you'll end up in the situation where if you don't know what the fuck you're doing. But you just stay in this relationship and the two of you just get used to it like a routine and you get into it and like 10, 15, 20 years down the road, you're best friends now. You're so comfortable with each other. And because, of your, because you're best friends, you're used to having this person in your bed, in your house, always there to, to just always there. Um, that's like, it becomes like a friendship. Like he's your, like women describe it like he's my brother and I want the best for him. I'm just not hot for him. You know, and this is... HSDD and, and all that. Like that's, I'll cover that in a different presentation. But that's there. That's there. Being best friends, marrying your best friend, that's a whole thing in Hollywood, right? Okay, so, and then there's agape. To sacrifice your own life for your beloveds, obviously that's there as well. And storge is there. Affection. Right? No, I, I love. I love you. Affection, right? So these are all different feelings, but they're all in there, rolled up together in this thing called romantic love. The thing that most guys, when they come to, come to me and to the group, to the Man Up group, or to where they get coaching, they're usually in the stage where the eros is gone. Okay? And she says, I love you. And he's hearing, I eros love you. Okay? And he's like, if you eros love me, then why, aren't you, why did you cheat on me? Right? But what she's saying is, I philia love you. I storge love you. You know, pat you on the head, nice little brother, you know. But those arrows, no, I, don't, I haven't felt that in years. <laughs> and this guy, this random sailor, <laughs> made me feel that, fantasizing about him. So that's, that's part of the, that's the problem. Confusion around the term love. And then, of course, tra how uh, equating love to attraction. Okay. So here's something that a lot of immature people will never well, I shouldn't say number, don't understand, which is that when you're in a couple, you, this is, I'll, I'll put it to you guys, because it's easier for you guys to understand this. If you see a hot-ass girl naked in front of you, bending over, you will still get hard, hopefully, if, you, if you're healthy, okay? And 
And but you might love you, you're gonna love your wife. You're holding her hand. <laughs> That's kind of a weird scenario. You're holding your wife's hand, and then this naked girl is bending over. But anyway, you, but you, like you're not gonna cheat on on your the wife you love. But your dick's gonna react if this girl keeps sticking her naked ass in your face, right? <laughs> get that? You get that, right? So you see how that comes apart, right? Eros and just straight up lust. So you might be. So you could say that you're attracted sexually to this naked woman, right? But that there's no feelings beyond that, right? You, you get that? Guess what? Women are the same way. They're human beings. They have evolved just like us. Yes, there are more penalties for them if they act slutty. <laughs> okay, nine months of penalties plus a lot more social, uh, you know, outcast kind of stuff. But they still have those feelings. And in fact, there's, there are many evolutionary psychology um, theories for why women engage in short-term mating strategies. And I'll, I'll cover that in a different presentation. Don't want to, that's, that's a whole other can of worms. But um, once you understand that Men and women are almost all alike in that sense, right? <laughs> there are differences, but they account for maybe 5% of what is actually happening in life. Women, too, can get really horny, and they can separate these different types of love. And what will happen in a relationship is, if you don't maintain that polarity of the masculine and feminine, and, and what will happen is you become, um, you become those that you spend the most time with. And if you're going to spend the most time of your life with your wife, you live with her, sleep with her, you know, you raise kids together, and she will become more like you, you will become more like her, and the masculine will inevitably take on the feminine just because he's around it. And the same with the feminine, she'll become more uh, masculine in a sense. And the natural thing is to depolarize, and that's why the lust goes away, the eros goes away. And you end up being best friends, affectionate, brotherly love. <laughs> Philia and, and Storge, and maybe she's gonna, she might sacrifice herself for you, for, but most. Modern people are quite self-centered and selfish, so it's probably not. <laughs> you know. And she's going to miss that Eros. And unfortunately, you are, if you're asking that question, you're coming for coaching, uh, you're in that one down position. And that's the one up, one down dynamic is a whole other presentation, um, but it's, it's not that difficult to understand. Um, as it's like a seesaw in a normal relationship. And over time, the person who needs it more is going to be, uh, who needs it more is going to be more needy. and he'll be less attractive, generally speaking. I'm get, oh, actually, I'm going to get into that next. And um, the guys who come to me are the ones who are in the one down position, generally, almost always. But plenty of women end up in the one down position as well. Okay, it's not a gendered thing. Um, and the one in the one down always thinks, um, oh, how do I get that? How do I get it? She loves me. How come it's not the electricity isn't there? And the answer is because the eros is gone. The passion is gone. And that happens naturally, as Jonathan Haidt's quote, quotation put down, um, points out. So love in the long term requires a commitment. Up, uh, in modern people, in, in, you know, throughout human history, we've needed to actually work at it. If it goes past you know, 40 years of our lives, we would have to work at it. We'd have to rekindle the passion. We'd have to um, re-love our lo beloved every day, every moment, and continue to be present and continue to build our own lives, and I'll get into that. But that requires a commitment. And guess what? Most, if you have a view of love as being a feeling, then you're not going to commit. Because if it's pure feeling, well, why would you commit? That destroys the romantic aspect of it. If you have to try, then it must not be love. And then we go back to Jonathan Haidt's, those four beliefs, right? If it was true love, then it should be easy. All right. Okay, so love in the long term requires a commitment. Well, let's move back to attraction because it all begins with attraction. A lot of the guys watching this video um, are in the first stage where they don't even have a relationship. <laughs> so let's talk about that because often the guy, like, you know, half the questions are about I'm single and this girl friend zoned me, right? So she's given him the, maybe, maybe, they're, maybe they're really good friends for all I know, right? Often they're not. <laughs> friend zone for that guy means she doesn't even notice him, right? But um, sometimes it's the stage where she's in philia love with him. She loves him like a brother. They end up trying to figure out how do I create the passion? How do I get her to be attracted to me? And uh, let's turn to what the science says about attraction. Okay, so we have, um, so physical attractiveness. There are uh, basically just two uh, traits that science has shown that universally are attractive to women um, in men. Um, so everything else is just uh, is going to be, well everything else I've seen is historically contingent. So the first is high testosterone 
The second is a certain uh, shoulder to hip ratio on a straight line measurement. So um, high testosterone is, so I'll give you some examples of the studies. There's a study that um, had uh, uh, the, the subjects, dudes, wear a t-shirt or t-shirts uh, and didn't take, weren't allowed to take them off. And I think it was like 48 hours. They weren't allowed to take them off and they had to wear them. And then as soon as that time is done, they take off the shirt, put it into this Ziploc bag. And then they, the girls are given a blind smell test. Uh, they have to smell that shirt and then rate the guy's physical attractiveness. Another one is where the guy wears a cotton pad taped to his armpits for whatever it is, 48 hours. And then at the end of that time, he, same thing, takes the uh, cotton, uh, cotton thing out, puts it in an airtight bag. Girls get to smell that as uh, you know, a blind test, and they rate the guy's level of attractiveness. And they take the guy's um, testosterone readings before uh, and after and all of this. And what they found is that women are able to, if you ask them how attractive is he, their attractiveness ratings uh, track very highly um, the men's level of testosterone. Okay. And then, uh, in fact, if she is ovulating at that time, it tracks even, it's even more accurate, her nose, uh, to be able to tell whether a guy is attractive to them, which means, actually, scientifically, the, the, it's high testosterone. So there's an epidemic of low testosterone in the world. Hopefully you know this by now. Um, and in the 50s, uh, the average testosterone levels were at like seven, over 700, I think like 750 something, NG over MOL, whatever the unit is. And now um, the average is understood to be around 375 or 400. Basically, scientists or uh, the medical world just basically lowered the bar by half. Like, let's not say everybody's suffering from low testosterone, let's just lower the bar. <laughs> and that's literally what's happened. Um, and so men around the world have just become less attractive physically. Um, and it's not even like with your eyes that you see a difference. It's the nose, they're through the olfactory nerves able to detect um, to them that what they're really reacting to is the testosterone. This has been repeated quite a lot. There's been a lot of research on this and blah, blah, blah. You can go look it up. Um, and there are other people who are experts on this, but um, you know, I'm, just, I'm just reporting the studies. And the other is uh, shoulder to uh, hip um, of 0.6 ratio. So if you take a photo, it's a flat line. You just take a ruler, measure it, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and that's just a marker of strength and fitness and health and so forth. Um, so, and it's similar to, and there's actually a lot more research for the women side of the waist to hip ratio. I think for women it's 0.7 um, that men consider to be ideal. Uh, and for many hundreds of years, uh, uh, thinkers, intellectuals have been trying to figure out what that perfect ratio is. Um, but that's, that's the one that's been studied um, for men. A lot more research exists for the testosterone uh, than for the straight line measurements. Um, so try to raise your testosterone, that'll help. Now, on all, I just got a question here. Now, all of these things I'm going to just blurt out, blah, blah, blah. There's a little list, like you can see here, a long list of things that women look for. Yes, if you were fit, and if you have high testosterone, that helps a lot, but that's not the only thing. So please don't get into your own insecurities and like, oh, but I don't have that. Oh, I'm fucked. You know, obviously, right? So like think about a girl, a woman who has all of these things that are wonderful and she's missing a few. She's still wonderful, right? Like, so just as this is what science tells us, women would prefer that you had these things, right? But that doesn't mean that the, the game over if you're missing one. Everybody's missing one or two or 500 of them. All right, so just this is what the science says, just so it's, we're clear on how to create attraction. Try to raise all of these uh, as, as much as you can, right? Social dominance is the next one on this list. Um, obviously, uh, evolutionary times, um, if you were dominant in your social hierarchy, it would be a better mating strategy for her to mate with you than for the, to mate with the weak guy who's going to end up getting bullied and killed and everything's going to be taken away from him. And instead, you know, and she and her offspring might be killed. Instead, it would have been better to be one of the concubines of the powerful guy. And that, for most of Homo sapien history, has been the case. Right? It would be better to, be, um, to have part of a billion dollars than all of 100,000. So social dominance, if you're able to be dominant over other people. Social alliances is very important. So guys who are very social and make friends easily, it's a good, it'll trigger an unconscious attraction in a woman because it is a good mating strategy to get with a guy who can make alliances easily because then you'll probably be stronger and survive better. So those who have higher social intelligence will generally be uh, a lot more attractive. Emotional health. 
Okay, because if you're a sobbing wreck all the time, she can't rely on you. Okay, and the same with mental health. If you're a psycho, that's really bad. <laughs> you could just kill her and all your kids. All, hey, right, so, um, so you, she's looking for a guy who's emotionally healthy and mentally healthy, and especially the emotional mental health will come into play as the most important determinant. Because emotional mental health will largely determine how good you are at relating to other people and so on, right? So the social stuff relies on the um, emotional mental, um, but of course the physical is an important part. As guys know, dirty boys. <laughs> right, ask yourself the same question, man. If you saw a girl who wasn't that physically fit and everything, can you still be attracted to her? I hope you're mature enough to say yeah. So it's just pretty obvious, right? Okay. What has evolution led women to want? All right, so beyond all of those things, this, and if you've read any of evolutionary psychology, that would all be uh, obvious to you or uh, old hat. Um, this one is, is a little bit more interesting, and this comes from Anthropology. There's a really great book on this that I've been picking up recently, that I picked up again recently. It's called Sapiens. I can't remember the author's name. It's like a three-word name. Um, but anyway, it's called just Google or Amazon search Sapiens, and um, it describes uh, the history of the Homo sapien. The first part is most relevant here, and it's the evolution and behavior link. So we are, there's a thing called evolutionary lag, where we are evolved. So mutations are, enter into the system. If the mutation is advantageous to survival or replication, it gets passed on, right? So think of X-Men, <laughs> right? So if this mutant power is very effective, then it's going to fuck a lot more, produce a lot more babies, and it spreads. But it takes quite a long time for it to spread, right? Uh, and generally, it takes 100,000 years. Now, things are going to get sped up a lot more, I think, or maybe slow down, I forget the theory. But um, we are the product of an adaptive, uh, an adaptation that was ideal, optimized, for the environment of 75,000 to 100,000 years ago. So this was just before the, the big ice age. Right? And back then, uh, we don't know a whole lot about <laughs> Homo sapiens back then, but what we do know is that there wasn't, um, it wasn't easy to accumulate uh, resources. So if you kill the saber-toothed tiger or whatever, you couldn't keep it for very long. The meat would go bad. Um, even with the stomachs back then, probably they could, they could stomach more, <laughs> but um, it still wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to stockpile the way, the way billionaires can stockpile wheat now and oil and all that. Back then you could stockpile maybe, you know, a couple tigers <laughs> and then that, sh that shit would go bad in a week, right? So you got to go out and continually hunt for it. It was a lot more gathering than hunting back then. So you could gather a whole bunch of vegetables, right? And so, so there could be a disparity, right? But um, back then, the research shows that there were so few Homo sapiens in the world that there was never really a lack of resources. Like nowadays, you look around your apartment, if you're in a city, where are you going to get, where are you going to sca scavenge for some like roots and stuff? Like, you know, so you got to go to McDonald's or whatever, fuck, right? But back then, there was like, it was, it was lush uh, ecology all around and lots more animals, by the way. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more riches of, of food and so there wasn't a big di disparity between uh, one guy and another guy. There wasn't a huge difference. Nowadays, there's a gigantic difference between the richest man and the poorest man. <laughs> um, but back then, it was pretty close, and you couldn't stockpile them. So, and most of the time, we have, they probably weren't wearing clothing very much, or maybe some skin of, a, of an animal, but most of the time, it was very basic, and uh, it's not like you could flash your car or your watch, and they didn't even have refrigerators back then. You didn't have a house, you know, you have like a cave or something. So when, so usually what will happen is you get a, a band of 12 to 15 or maybe 20 homo sapiens and they, so they're not going to just keep doing incest with each other. So you got to go out and meet other uh, bands. So what will happen is while they're out gathering, hunting, or whatever, they'll meet another female, like a, a male, meet another female, and they're like, ooh, ooh, <laughs> right? So then they're like, how do they, do, how does the girl decide whether to give up nine months to that guy? Okay, or how does the guy decide whether he's going to, well, actually, you probably can tell why, how a guy decides whether he's going to uh, spring on her, but how does she decide whether to let it happen? So um, they didn't have the typical things that people now have. It's hard to tell whether, it's, it's hard back then to tell whether he has a lot of resources because there weren't that many resources to stockpile anyway. And on his person, it's not like he could just show her her bank account, his bank account or whatever. So he's, she's like, huh, how does she decide? 
The females that evolved the ability to tell whether a guy has social, the skills to have social alliances, um, what else do we put down there? Social dominance, mentally and emotional health, were the ones who won. Of course, they're also sizing you up visually, and they're smelling you, so that's, that's not changed, as far as we can tell. But uh, in terms of figuring out whether he has the resources, emotional health, and mental health, and the dominance, and social savvy, and all that, she had to detect that through what? Through behavior. So we get to the evolution behavior link. She was detect the, the females who could detect through behavioral cues whether he was healthy emotionally and mentally and whether he was dominant and socially and socially and savvy were the ones who succeeded. They had to choose pretty quickly. Um, so that's how well, that's what they had to go on 100,000 years ago. And females are still like that. Right? Now they're getting all confused with certain signs of wealth and resources. Right? But what they're actually evolved to do is not to look for the car, okay, the fancy car. They're not evolved to look for uh, the bank account or like in, on your, when you are swiping on Tinder, it would just be you know, a snapshot, a screenshot of your bank account instead. They're not evolved to do that. That's, too, that's much further down and that, was, that wouldn't have happened until about 12,000 years ago. We're looking at 100,000 years ago. Um, and back then we didn't have agriculture or any, or any of that. And, and for, we may not have even had jewelry back then um, or very, very basic jewelry. So what she's looking for is how socially savvy is he? How emotionally, mentally healthy is he? Uh, how dominant is he? Of course, they're looking for his physical fitness as well. So that is all going to be through the behavior and the visual for the physical part. So what is it exactly that they're looking for in the behavior? Um, so modern studies are look. Uh, now show status, resources, and health, but status and resources are secondary to the mental and emotional resources uh, and the social intelligence to get the status and resources. So women generally don't fantasize over a lottery winner. Okay, a lottery winner is just as rich as the guy who earned that money, but they're not like, oh yeah, the lottery winner, oh. Right, there's not that much Harlequin romances about the lottery winner. So that's just a great example of, and if he's like a third generation trust fund kid, you know, she's not going to be turned on because he didn't earn it. She, he'll attract a lot of gold diggers, but it's not going to be attraction. It'll just be a, a rational calculation. So um, how could she tell whether um, he was go is going to be able to accumulate resources for her and her family and to be able to accrue the status, to gain the status, by observing his behavior? What exactly is she observing in his behavior? She's looking for emotional independence. Emotional independence. Emotional independence displays a lack of deference towards others. So if he is a weak uh, male homo sapien who cannot hunt very well for himself, cannot gather very well for himself, he will be deferring to other homo sapiens who can. And so he will be used to the mm, submission, and just as you see this in the primate world, and then the, the king, the Conor McGregor kind of walk, right? The, big, the silverback walk. You know, like his chin is up and everything. He's, he's confident. She's looking for that in his behavior, not just in his body language, but also the way he interacts with other males, the way he interacts with her, with confidence. You can see that women all uh, say they want confidence, and they largely are tr that's largely true. They want a confident man because part, confidence comes from being that emotionally independent person. He's not approval-seeking. And he's not desperate and begging. Right? So those are all things that they're evolved to be attracted to. If you want to attract her more, don't fucking beg, friend zone boy. <laughs> like a lot of these guys, the second friends will be like, but let me make an argument. Right? Like they'll like write a long letter with all these reasons why they're a good match. Fuck reasons. Right? Hopefully by this point you will realize that attraction is a feeling and an emotion. It is not a rational, it's not something that you arrive at through rational argumentation. So what is the thing that's so repellent to them? It's codependent neediness. Codependent neediness. I've, you know, like four years ago, I used to teach neediness, um, and uh, I just left it there baldly, like neediness. It's just like neediness and non-neediness. Um, I have since learned over this three, four years that uh, there are human needs that are very legitimate. Uh, you know, we have a need, everyone, for a certain degree of security, of unpredictability, of, of uh, significance, of love, of connection, uh, of growth. So we all have these needs. These are fine needs to have. And it's, it's never, you never want to get to the point where you don't need anything because then you're just lying to yourself. Um, we all need, uh, we all have needs. But there is a level of need where it becomes neurotic. 
and um, I'm adopting here the term codependent, and it's a lot more complex than that. There's a lot more clinical psychology to, to bring in here, but I'm just simplifying it for this video, for this presentation, that it's a kind of codependent neediness that turns women off. The biggest factor in whether a woman likes, another, uh, likes a man, is whether a woman is attracted to a man, is the man's perceived level of codependent neediness. Right? What, how she, w whether she sees him as being needy. And you can be codependent needy towards one woman and not towards another. I mean, there's many women that you're not codependent needy towards, you know, the random people in the subway or whatever. But that girl that you're with, if you go codependent needy on her, it will repel her. It's like inversely proportional. Um, so how do you get, how do you make sure that you're not codependently needy? How do you make sure that you're independent? Um, well, uh, I, I'm just going to rattle these off uh, because these are the titles of entire other two-hour classes. Okay, So there's uh, values and principles. Um, and in, in, just as a note within that, I mean moral values, but I also mean emotions. Which emotions are most important for you to experience? Um, and that's a really deep one about your own self-awareness, about what it takes for you to be happy and fulfilled and so on. And another one is boundaries. So you need to know where your boundaries are uh, in your life. You have to set those. And you also have to be clear about um, what your responsibilities are with other people. Okay, so that's another deep thing. Um, and then, of course, purpose and passion and self-esteem. So I'm just going to point those out here, but I can't go into detail on any of those uh, in this presentation. But that's how you get that uh, independence. Now, um, I'm going to change that slide from non-neediness, which is an empty term, to independence. How independence or um, emotional independence is manifested. So again, attraction is not a choice. Um, so how she feels towards you doesn't matter about what, um, what, you can, what reasons you can give her. So um, you, might, um, you might be able to argue for your case that you're not codependent needy. But if, her, but if you're behaving as a codependent needy person, she unconsciously will just be repelled by it because attraction is not a choice. Okay, so if you want to trigger attraction, you have to go at the emotional level, the feelings level. Screw this rational argumentation stuff. So stop talking about, talk, if you want to create attraction, then avoid the factual and logical. As soon as you go factual and logical, you're turning her into your friend. Okay, you're, you're turning into her, her into your brother, into a debating partner. There's not going to be any eros there. There's no lust or passion there. If you want lust and passion, you've got to go with emotions and feelings because that's what those are. Lust and passion are emotions and feelings. Attraction is a feeling. Attraction is an emotion. So most guys, even when they get together, or I should say especially when guys get together, they completely avoid talking about feelings and emotions. It makes most men uncomfortable, and that's why they suck. <laughs> right? And that's why they can't grow. Most men can't grow, because they're not even aware of their own feelings, because they don't even have the fucking vocabulary to talk about their feelings. So um, women, wanna, they, 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 they ex a feminine woman exists in the emotional, in the sensory. Right? So, when you're speaking with a woman, you need to practice you, like accessing the emotional side of you, but also talking about things in terms of emotions. I'll give an example, a very easy, trivial example, but of course it gets a lot deeper. But an easy surface example is, instead of saying, when you're talking about travel, instead of talking about like what you saw in Paris, and when, what time of year you went, or what weather you had, or uh, there, or whatever, like, uh, first you did this, then you did that, and then you did this, and you start rattling it off like a Lonely Planet tour guide. Instead, talk about how it felt to be there, how it felt to be standing in the Louvre after reading about it for so long, how it felt to be looking at the Mona Lisa, how it felt to be standing under the Eiffel Tower, or to go up the Eiffel Tower, how it felt to be walking down the Champs d'Elysees uh, in the middle of the evening or whatever with a glass of wine in your hand, how it felt, how does it feel, how does it feel, how does it feel, focus on the feelings, um, and then that will get her sense in the sensory mode. Talk about how, uh, what things, um, talk about them in terms of describing the sensory, um, the sensory feelings of those. Um, how did it, you know, what did it taste like? How did it, uh, how did the, the wind feel on your skin? <laughs> um, talk about what uh, the colors you saw, or just focus on that. Like, so hopefully you understand it's not just factual and logical in the sense of like, um, a boring list of like dry facts. Uh, that will never work. Um, but the easiest thing to do is just focus on how you felt and how she feels. And in fact, everybody is interested in how 
um, how uh, interested in feelings. So for instance, if, if I want to get you interested in the conversation, I can ask your friend, how did he feel about that? Pointing at you. And you're going to be, what? What's going on here? Right, because everybody's interested in themselves. <laughs> um, but they're also, in order, like, so she'll talk about herself, but only, she'll, she'll only open up to you specifically if, there's, if she's attracted to you. So you need to also share about yourself. So just keep it equal. Um, just share each other, your feelings, ask her how she felt, and so forth. Um, feelings over thoughts, if you want to create attraction. If you just want to be friends and be in the friend zone, go for thoughts. You know, how to be in the friend zone course. How to uh, just do the opposite of everything I'm teaching here. <laughs> All right, so the other thing is, is the evolutionary psychology has done a lot of surveys, like asking women, what do you like in a man? And they'll say the cliched things of status, power, uh, status, wealth, and, and fitness, right? So uh, there's a certain truth to that. In their rational prefrontal cortex, they will say those things. But what they're actually reacting to is your behavior because they're trying to detect your mental and emotional health and your social dominance and alliances, right? So what she's going to be looking for is instead of you saying you have lots of money and a fancy car and a uh, fancy condo and whatever, She's going to be looking for your behavior. So if you're like dangling your Maserati keys around or showing, this is my Lamborghini, it's not very attractive. It's sort of douchebaggy. Oh, in America, douchebaggy sort of works because there's so many. <laughs> uh, but it's not very classy, right? Uh, so, so it's like you're putting too much into it. Because if, if it's really not a big deal, then you wouldn't, even, you wouldn't even talk about it. It'd be like, oh, yeah, I have these jeans on. Yeah, big deal, right? So it's a lot cooler and a lot more attractive if, for example, she's really into you because you have some fun conversation, you make her laugh, another feeling, right? Make her laugh, humor is great for getting into the feelings. Humor, and then she's talking about her feelings, you know, and then she, you walk out to the parking lot and there's your car, the valet brings it up and it's some fancy expensive car, and you're like, oh yeah, get in. It's not a big deal, and then she will be like, whoa, okay. You know, that's, that's the behavior of a man who has the resources and doesn't think a big deal of them because he hasn't. Demonstration over verbalization, always more important in creating attraction. Um, also dominance and frame control. If you can hold your frame, she will sense that you are somebody who is socially dominant. Uh, however, the, best, the, the only attractive way to do this is to do it unconsciously. In other words, if you're thinking, okay, now I've got a frame control, you're already fucked. It's just like the guy who's like, okay, now I'm gonna show off my car, you're fucked. Have these things, develop them, cultivate them, train them in yourself so that you have them naturally. Um, so you don't need to have frame control, for example, with, hopefully, with somebody that is a flat earther, right? Or somebody who believes that the sun revolves around the earth. Okay, hopefully if you've gone through high school science, you're not going to have your frame shaken by a guy like that. He's like, but look, it's flat. Look, at you, it's flat, right? You're like, hopefully you're not like, oh shit, is it flat? Maybe it was a conspiracy, right? Now, your frame isn't going to get thrown off because you believe it's true. Your frame is only thrown off when you doubt whether it's true. So uh, the best thing to do is to know who you are, know what you're about, and know those things very well, like self-awareness and emotional awareness. Then you don't need to bother with frame control. But a way to analyze what's actually happening is frame control, right? Like, okay, now she's challenging his frame, he holds to it because he believes it's the truth, and she's attracted, right? That's frame control, his dominance. And of course, a sense of humor, right? Because a sense of humor is great on a lot of different, for a lot of different reasons. One, intelligence, all right? So you notice that like the less intelligent people generally are laughing at physical humor. And then as you get higher in intelligence generally, the jokes uh, and the humor becomes more layered, subtle, and complex. Um, and uh, so uh, one of the last things that will happen if you do classical studies, like classical Chinese, is to learn the humor in the drawings, for instance, or the humor in some ancient text. Um, that's like, oh wow, you really understand, get to the heart of their culture. And it, so intelligence is one. The other is, he doesn't take himself too seriously, so he doesn't feel like he's, he's not desperate and begging for approval. He doesn't need approval from others, and remember what that means. He's emotionally independent. He's not needy. Okay, so that's another one. Uh, humor also shows uh, that not just, the, uh, but, uh, not just intelligence and not just emotional independence, um, but also ar being articulate and uh, quick verbally um, shows a different kind of intelligence. Right? So, or I guess that's still intelligence. Okay, just, there you go. Humor is good to have. Oh, right, sorry. Emotion. So when you're laughing, you let your guard down and it creates trust. So you're able to 
bridge that trust gap with a person because they'll only really have a hearty laugh with you if they trust you and they let their guard down. And you're able to incite that emotion. So those are four things, right? Humor, just awesome. Get some humor training. You know, whether that means you're taking, taking some improv comedy classes or stand-up comedy or you just study it, um, very important for attraction and to be an attractive person and just to have fun in life. Don't take yourself so seriously. There's too many neuroses going around. <laughs> All right. A little bit deeper into parasitic neediness. Let's go to a deeper level. So we, we're leaving the evolutionary stuff, the paleoanthropology stuff, and now we're going into the clinical psychology of it. Um, and trying to understand that codependent neediness. In this context, I want to call it parasitic because that's the relationship here. Um, men who need women to complete them end up using these women for their own emotional needs to fill an emotional void in himself. That's why it's called parasitic. This is so, so much deeper. And in fact, there's a whole other course um, that I've created that's a year long, actually many years, multi-year course called Awakenings, where uh, every week I hop on a live show um, and I do a live show co coaching call with the guys. And we go deep into the clinical psychology of many things, but among those many things is this. Um, but just at a very basic level here. Um, and uh, so he's looking to fill that emotional void in himself. Uh, a good resource on this is Glover's book, No More Mr. Nice Guy. I know a lot of you guys in here have read that. Um, and he has a great term, uh, looking to plug, a man who's like this is looking to plug his emotional, his, sorry, his umbilical cord into a woman. And there are a lot of women. I used to do a radio show here, uh, and a lot, it was like 70% women over 40 years old who were listening to it. And a lot of the call-ins were um, co like s complaining that the guy that they're seeing uh, treats him, treats her like his mother. Right. So this was a common thing. I was like, I didn't realize just how common it was until I, I was on that uh, regular radio show. Um, health, a healthy relationship can only be had between two individuals who are complete and full of themselves, full in themselves, and complete in terms of being independent. They can meet their own needs. They don't need um, those outside themselves to meet those needs, their emotional needs. Okay, they can meet their own needs. Here's a great example what I call the epitome of neediness, the you complete me thing. And it comes from this excellent book, Daniel Bergner's What Do Women Want? Some of it's quite controversial, some of it is sloppy journalism, um, but it does report some very interesting findings that have been happening in sexology. So um, I'm just gonna quote this at length here. The seeking of a lover to embody these words, the pining for a love that will be unconditional, the search for a union that is absolute, the sense that our partner should give us what we were given or what we believe we should have been given by our parents. The craving for reassurance. Tell me I'm special. Tell me I'm beautiful. Tell me I'm smart. Tell me I'm successful. Tell me you love me. Tell me it's forever, no matter what, till death do us part. These were scarcely more than a child's cries, yet most of us could not bear to give up on these longings. Most of us could not stand to relinquish the yearning for someone to be our fulfillment, our affirmation. Because to turn away from such hope would be to acknowledge that we are inescapably navigating our lives alone, supported by love if we are lucky, but finally out on our own. And that is the growing up that most people do not do because they cling to this. Uh, and then if you were feeling these things, uh, you need coaching, you need therapy, you need to commit to a long-term uh, uh, practice of self-examination and self-awareness because you will grow if you go through this, you grow, and each stage you grow, new realizations and new breakthroughs are preceded by um, the pits. You've you got to enter in the, into the, through the, the, the hard stuff um, to earn the good stuff. And most people get stuck at like, it's sort of like a video game, like level two, when they don't realize there's like level 20 and, and higher in the game. Um, and they keep getting frustrated at a level two because they're still at these level two needs. Okay, these are childhood neuroses, or they were neuroses that began in childhood, um, and uh, you, you need to grow through these. Again, there's a course, Awakenings, where I go into detail on these. You can find out more about Awakenings in the Man Up Facebook group. Join the private Facebook group. <laughs> okay, so next slide. Um, guys who are learning this also have difficulty understanding the difference between a lover and a provider. Uh, I see this distinction uh, or this lack of understanding of this dichotomy confusing a lot of guys uh, around the world. So just briefly on this, um, women slot men into different categories. 
Um, generally, if you think about it as like a ladder, it's, it's very difficult for a man to move up the ladder. It's very easy for him to move down the ladder. What is does this ladder consistent? Well, at the very bottom, I guess the very bottom is like a, almost like a killer, like a guy. But like, okay, so near the bottom is rapist. Let's say, okay, so if you raped her, that's pretty bad. Okay, and then uh, let's say above that there is uh, a stranger, total stranger. She doesn't know anything about you, neutral. And between that, there's a lot more. There's creepy guy. Okay, let's say this is rapist and then creepy guy. Okay, so if you started out as a rapist, it's going to be hard for you to move up to a mere creepy guy. <laughs> you see how that works, right? But if you're a creepy guy, it's pretty easy to become a rapist, right? So rapist, creepy guy, then creepy guy to neutral guy. She doesn't even think about you. You're just a stranger in the in the train. Notice how if you started out creepy, it's pretty hard to go up to neutral now. But neutral, it's pretty easy to become creepy. Okay, so getting it. Rapist, creepy, neutral guy, stranger. And then from stranger to acquaintance. And then acquaintance to a friend. Okay. And then friend to, uh, look, there's many grades in between here, like best friends and so on. But let's say a provider, a guy who um, she, she would uh, allow, get into a relationship where he, she allows him to provide for her. And there are grades of that. There's like sugar daddy, right? But then there's like a husband who provides for the family or maybe a, a husband who supports the family so she becomes a housewife um, financially. Though many housewives do a lot of work, but you get the idea. So provider, right? And then above provider, and this is the part that most guys don't know. So those are more intuitive, is lover. And this is where guys get tripped up. And this is part of the whole reason I'm making this video. They don't understand how I'm providing for her. I'm giving her, I've sacrificed so much. I've given her everything. And yet she still cheats on me or still fucks or still wants to fuck that guy or whatever. Right? A woman that you love, that you've loved for three to five, ten years, could have given you everything you really love her. But when you haven't had sex in a long time and that porn's right there, you just, you know, that happens. You as a man understand that. So I'm hoping to connect with you on that one. <laughs> Women are the same way. Love, it's, it's so, it's easy for a guy that she goes to fuck to become a provider. Because all he's got to do is add some money to it. Right? So, right? And then actually above lover is the guy she pays, right? So she becomes sugar mama to him or supports him. And the only value he needs to provide is his dick, right? Like he provides sexual value purely. And she'll pay for that. Then that's a level above. And then there's more. It's like then, oh, there's like pimp and so on, right? <laughs> right? She'll fuck other guys and give him all the money. You know, anyway, let's not go there. Um, but there's lover and provider. Now, it's hard, like I said, to, to go up the ladder. It's very easy to move down the ladder. So a lot of guys are coming in at provider zone. They're, uh, you, and you see this from the non-Westerners in the Man Up group who are like, uh, how do I um, ask her to be my girlfriend? How do I, um, how do I like, they, they think of it's like, it's almost like proposing to her, right? And they, and they haven't even like dated yet. Like he's proposing to be the boyfriend, right? Like it's crazy. And basically what he's doing is he's coming in at friend zone, trying to move up to provider, but hoping to be a lover because he wants the sex. <laughs> right? And that, you don't go that. That's like a rapist trying to become a stranger. <laughs> okay? That's how hard it is. So um, what you, the easier thing to now, are, if you're in damage control, you're stuck in friend zone or whatever, there's a whole course on that for you uh, in the Man Up Primer. There, it's not complete, like hope is not completely lost. There are, uh, I think there's five strategies I pointed out there. Uh, three primary ones. And you can get that in the Man Up Primer, which is free in the Man Up Facebook group. So you got to join the Facebook group to get that free video course. Um, but that's in there. So you can get out of there, but you're in damage control. The better thing would have been to, the best practice is to come in as a lover. And then if you want to, yeah, be a provider. That's how it works because the passion and the lust is harder to create because it's fickle. And for most people, they have no idea how it comes and goes. They have no clue. It's like a ghost. Is that a good analogy? But they don't know where, it's like a spirit. They don't know where it comes from and how it goes. So, um, whereas commitment is like, okay, it's a rational decision I'm going to make. But lust is not. Eros is, well, depending on what you mean by eros. But lust and passion are not. Lust and passion come about through the unconscious. The unconscious mind through triggering certain emotions. Well, those are the emotions that are triggered, right? Lust and, and uh, passion. Um, and those, you got to aim for that. It's easy then if you spend enough time with each other and, and, uh, and, do, and put her needs, um, take her needs into account and in a certain way put them above yours, then you will be connected. You will have that love connection. The harder part is creating the passion. 
when it wasn't there to begin with. And how do you do that? I, I told you um, all of the scientific things that, or all the scientific evidence uh, and research for what women want uh, or are attracted to in men. So the more of those you have, the easier it will be for you to attract um, the woman you want. Um, but also, uh, if you come in and you provide sexual value from the get, from the beginning, um, then you can go down all you want. <laughs> Probably don't want to go too far down, but you can go down and you can incorporate lower, la lower la uh, rungs of the ladder. So um, just a point here, uh, traits uh, are, take priority over tangible signs. I think I've covered that quite a bit in the, in the issue about wealth. Um, one interesting case to, to sort of encapsulates this difference between the lover and the provider is the rich man versus the pool boy. And uh, it's a great way to um, describe companionate versus sexual attraction. So the rich man, and maybe at the beginning he was very sexy and all this, but if you're rich, you are working, right? So like, well, mostly, you have to work to create that, that amount of money to be rich. And if you did all that, you probably just, when you retire, won't just sit on the beach and do nothing. If you're the type of guy to create an empire, your mind is gonna be restless, right? So in other words, you're gonna be out of the house making deals or doing work or whatever. And if you just got a girl because she's hot, or she's intelligent. Every guy wants an intelligent woman, but he doesn't actually not is not attracted to her. The science shows that uh, he's intimidated by intelligent, truly intelligent women. On paper, he wants an intelligent woman. That's why you never believe the paper shit. Um, look at what they do. Uh, but uh, uh, whatever, he wants a girl who's just going to stay home, right? And then when he comes home, sucks his dick, right? That's what he wants. He doesn't really care what she does what does when he's out of the house. So he comes home late at night because he's working hard, like for a purpose, right? And um, she's the board housewife. Now, if she is driven by, her, if she is ruled by emotion, then when the pool boy comes to clean the pool, and he is topless, with, you know, young man, ripped abs, and his value is primarily sexual. There's like no resources value there. Um, she might hook up with that guy because he provides the sexual value, cheating on the rich man for it because the rich man provides the provider value. Now, who's going to get hurt more in that situation? Is a pool boy, pool boy going to be like, hey, fuck this, man. You married that guy and you fucked it. I want everything. No, he's not going to be like, hey, 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 I got away with what I got away with. How do I know this? Because I know a lot of guys do that kind of shit. Right? And the rich man, is he going to feel happy about this? He'd be like, oh, good. Then I don't have to do the sex stuff. I'll outsource it to that guy. Hell no. He's going to be like, fucking bitch whore. I did all this for her. I sacrificed all this. I gave her everything. She cheated on me. So that's the disparity, right? That's why we say the lover is actually in a stronger position than the provider, even though he ain't got the money, per se, in that situation. Though you could also be the rich man who doesn't provide. Right? There's a lot of cases of that. The rich man with the mistress, um, who doesn't pay for the mistress, right? But in that case of the rich man pool boy, it is most stark, because the pool boy doesn't have those resources, but he gets what the rich man wants. Um, the rich man gets slotted into, into provider, Pool boy's lover, that's the problem there. Uh, power of first impressions. So how she slots you in happens, uh, the, a big part of it happens in the first impression. How quickly are first impressions created, guys? Three seconds. Three seconds, okay, yeah, you guys all know. <laughs> so something like three seconds or less. Uh, they split second judgment. And there's a lot of research on this. They've done research on presidential uh, candidates, muting the sound, split second de decision, who's gonna win, all these. They've done, they've done the same sort of thing with uh, university professors teaching, um, a lot of things. And you as a man know when you're scrolling through that nasty ass porn, you ain't taking more than three seconds to decide whether you wanna pause and put, press play on that shit. You look and then bang, right? Women too, they look and they judge whether you're uh, a creepy, weird guy, let's get away. They don't look and calculate, okay. It's because they're not like Sherlock Holmes and like, okay, because of the nape of his, she's not, she's just uh, immediate reaction. Um, that's why that, the fundamentals are so important, the body language, the eye contact, the tonality, the fashion, um, but most of all, the behavior, the way you hold yourself, the way you interact with others. Um, she, human beings pick up on that and are, have been evolved. We as homo sapiens have evolved the ability uh, just for survival to end replication, to, to judge split second um, whether somebody has um, that, uh, the attractive character traits that we're looking for. So just to end off, give a little um, how-to kind of stuff for the guys who are, maybe all of that stuff was too deep and heavy for you, um, but everybody likes some how-to. A question I get asked all the time, it's easy to dispatch here in this context, how do I know whether she likes me? All right, so there's some very basic things to look for. 
Uh, I break it down into two categories, physical and verbal. I'm just going to rattle these off because there are all kinds of other behaviors she likes you. Like if she, if she you know, gives her, her kidney to you, it's probably a sign she loves you. Um, but there are other like, less dramatic things. So physical, if she's preening near you, uh, or especially if she's preening while looking at you, uh, which means it's unconscious, which means she's making herself look pretty. And that could just be stroking the hair. It could be uh, straightening her, her dress. It could be whatever, right? Like, and oh, by the way, Okay, so just as another caveat for people who don't think very well, but this is for intelligent men. Um, obviously, these are not 100%, right? So, but the more of these signs that are present, the greater the chances that she's attracted to you, okay? That's all that is. It's probabilities. Um, so there are some girls who might just be fucking OCD and don't like that fucking thing in their dress so they're going to straighten it out, right? Um, but many times, preening is a sign that she's trying to make herself look pretty unconsciously um, and sometimes consciously doing her lipstick when you're away um, or near you or whatever, uh, straightening her up, making sure she looks pretty. Um, that's a sign. Proximity, if she's near you and getting closer to you, um, that's a good sign that she likes you. If she's facing you, directionality, she's facing you. If she's making eye contact with you or um, in some, uh, some more conservative societies like in Asia, if she's looking down, which is a sign of submission, looking towards you or down. If she's looking away uh, up or to the side, that's generally not a good sign of eye contact. If she's looking right in your eyes or looking down. Um, if she's touching you, if she's touching herself, all good things. If she's following you, following you around uh, from place to place to place, good sign. And then, of course, the scientific signs of arousal, which in TV shows like Lie to Me and in like the FBI and CIA, they look for this stuff because they're very hard to fake, which are dilating pupils, um, uh, increased heart rate. Uh, there are other kinds of signs. Oh, like if she's wet down there. <laughs> Hold on, are you attracted to me? Oh, yeah. I don't know. But those are scientific markers like that in scientific studies to, to know whether she's aroused. Um, and there's, there are probably others, but generally to the naked eye, uh, you're not going to be able to see these things very easily. So just don't worry about them too much. The verbal. If she's agreeing with you, that's usually a good sign. Um, especially if she changes her mind in order to agree with you. Like if, she's, if you contradict her and she says, she says, oh yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. Okay, that's usually a good sign. If she's reacting to you, that could be good. Or, that could be like negative or positive reaction. doesn't really matter. Just the fact that she's reacting to you at all is a good sign that she's into you. Um, so some mentally unstable women, maybe very passionate women, um, like to argue and maybe they have a worthiness problem so they like to flash out, right? Um, that can be fine. That's actually a sign that you're getting under her skin. She'd only allow you to get under her skin if she liked you. And you would have learned this in when you were like, if you were good with women in se at seven years old. <laughs> okay, excitability. If she's like, oh my God, or like giggly, giggly. That's a good sign. Um, if she gives you attention, if she doesn't give you attention, that's a very bad sign. Um, but if she gives you attention, it's a good sign. If she asks you questions, um, anybody who asks you questions, it's a good sign. However, don't um, get on a question train where she asks you more than two questions in a row and you just answer. That will kill attraction simply because you end up being, she ends up like being the interrogator. Um, if she's contributing to the conversation, so try to get her to talk as much as possible. Don't interrupt her um, as a general rule of thumb. Um, let her, that's, that'd be like kicking, the, kicking a puppy in the face. If you want to have a good conversation with a woman, you want her to contribute. You want her to open up and talk. Um, so let her do that as much as possible. Uh, and vulnerability, which means she opens up and tells you secrets or tells you things that are maybe more personal than you'd expect when, first, uh, when two people first meet. Okay, I got one slide here on life purpose. I'm just going to read it out because this is already quite a long uh, video here. Um, but there's a lot more to be said here. I'm leaving this because, to the end because I want you to because I want to leave you with something about how to become more emotionally independent. I've gone over and over. I've gone over the repercussions of being um, codependent. Uh, then how do I get away from being codependent and become independent? Um, life purpose is a really important part of it. Now, life purpose sounds really too big. Um, your, the purpose of your life at this moment, at this time, which will change as your life evolves, of course. Um, but uh, there's a great book by David Data called The Way of the Superior Man. And uh, what he says there is very good about purpose. He's got a lot of chapters on purpose. That's just a starting point, by the way. It's not the end all and be all, please. This is the first book. There are tons of books, tons of resources on life purpose. Um, it, it, just, it just continues. More and more are getting published every year that are very, very good. Um, so David Data uh, puts it quite well. 
A man's purpose will be his guiding light through the challenges of life and love. Um, and it should be a purpose that is besides women. So if you make women or finding that one your purpose, you're not going to be an attractive male. You're not going to be um, an in emotionally independent male. You won't be um, attractive to women, uh, feminine women, I should say. Self-fulfillment rests in finding those things that bring you pleasure and excelling in them. Actually, there's a lot more to be said on this as well, self-esteem and all this, um, but that's a good way to start. Uh, so if you understand what flow means, this is a term from the, uh, the 90s, um, in, in, and it's now a huge uh, industry, you could say, or a huge field, um, the psychology of peak performance. And flow is the o one of the only voluntary activities we can do that will guarantee us happiness and fulfillment. So maximize flow experiences throughout the day. That will help you to be fulfilled. It's basically like following your passion and doing that. Following your passion may not bring you money though. So depending on how good you are at that passion. So um, maybe you'll have to do that, something else for your day job that at least you like. Um, and then you have your passion on the weekends or at night or whatever. Um, but it's important for you to be to be li living, living a passionate life and a life that has purpose beyond just yourself, beyond just meeting your uh, animal needs of sex and food and sleep and shitting, but that there's something deeper to your life and there's a greater purpose to it. Okay, and that will help you to become, actually if you do those things, it will, you will be emotionally independent because you will be meeting your own needs. All right, so to recap, what I covered in this video and this presentation, what the science tells us about attraction versus love and I went into detail on that difference, um, looked at detail on what evolutionary psychology tells us about attraction, uh, female to male attraction. I went into codependent neediness and parasitic neediness. Uh, I went into the difference between the lover and the provider and the different categories. And then I went into life purpose and how to tell whether a girl likes you. Um, but I want to put out a caveat here. This is really good, feel good stuff, right? Find flow, find happiness, find purpose. But if you don't have social skills or if your social intelligence is bad, you're still not going to have a wide variety or big or a lot of options when it comes to uh, dating opportunities. So you still need to bone up on these skills of how to talk to people. Um, but once you get rid of the emotional, once it's less of emotional baggage, if you don't bring emo all of this emotional um, uh, damage or damage is the wrong word, but emotional immaturity to it, and it's purely like a skill set that you just need to learn, then it'll be much faster, much easier to do in developing social intelligence. It is something you can develop um, and uh, it is something you can learn that anybody can learn and get better at. Uh, it's conversational skills um, and uh, calibration uh, in conversation. Those are skills that can be learned uh, and you need to learn them if you want to get good at flirting and um, have more opportunities with women. Um, but it's it's important to delay that foundation of self-fulfillment uh, first and then emotional independence because then, then the learning of the skills is a lot faster and easier. Share this video if you liked it and uh, make sure that you join the private Facebook group um, for, uh, for more uh, free courses um, inside that group and uh, I'll see you inside the group. Until then, man up! <laughs>